Hello and welcome back to Furious Driving. Now this is a bit of a different video today and for the last few weeks during lockdown I've been trying to give you some workshop stuff two maybe three times a week as I progress with the cars. Well I've finally hit a bit of a stumbling block in that the delivery systems are kind of overwhelmed at the moment. I've got stuff coming for the Volvo, for the V8 and the Alpha. I was going to be bringing you an Alpha welding video today. Unfortunately on day one of the welding the welder broke and I've ordered a new part for the welder but it's not here yet because unlike regular times when I could have just walked into Machine Mart, bought the part off the shelf and be going again within the hour, it's about a four or five day turnaround now at the least to get the new parts. So <laughs> I, I could send you a video of a few minutes of me starting a job, but no one wants that. So today, I mentioned I might do it the other day, um, and today I am. We are now gonna talk about the worst car I have ever owned. And it's not what you might think it would be. Was it the 300 pound Ford Escort, which was about 15 or 20 years old at the time I bought it, which was so shonky that there was grit in the carburetor and you had to stop on the motorway sometimes and shake it to get fuel flowing and drive down the motorway one-handed because the sunroof would fly open at speed. No, that wasn't the worst car. It was bad, but not the worst. Was it the 1500 pound Alpha 33 Cloverleaf, which, well, if I'd listed every problem with that car, there wouldn't be time for anything else. But uh, if it was hot, it wouldn't restart. The door windows kept dropping into the doors. The tail lights sometimes worked, often didn't. It would unlatch the boot while you were driving and eventually dropped its entire heater matrix coolant over my feet when I was driving home from the pub one night. But that was a cheap, old, battered Alpha with a bad reputation. And so it was to be expected. And that car had heart, it had spirit. So it was kind of forgiven and expected. So. It wasn't the worst because it was kind of predictable and I'm an alpha lover, I say that. Was it the Alpha 156 I did 150,000 miles in? No, that car was probably the best car I ever owned. It never put a foot wrong, apart from needing lots of tires and wishbones because the engine was too heavy. That was just service. That car was fantastic, I wish I still had that. Shouldn't have sold that one. Was it the Mondumo, the uh, Mondeo Mark III Titanium X, which I had kind of at the beginning of this channel um, as an exercise in failed bangonomics? No, that was bad, but then I paid next to nothing for a bad car and then it paid me back in kind. So again, you can't really call it the worst car because you get what you pay for. For a car to be the worst car I've ever owned, it has to be something that utterly failed to live up to its expectations and let me down worse than anything in its position should have done. And that car was a 2008 BMW E61 520D Touring. Now having had several Alphas, my wife had a 147, I had the 156, which I had for five years and did all those miles in. Then I had a 159, which I absolutely adored and was on target to becoming the best car I'd ever owned. Unfortunately, it was taken for me too soon um, at the hands of another car hitting it head on and so didn't have that on too long sadly so I was in the market for a new car in a hurry and what I should have done was stick with the 200 pound MG ZS I bought off the back of a car lot as a part exchange get rid of special because that was quite a good car as it goes I was doing a lot of work for a magazine called BMW car back then and I put up with a lot of let's call them jibes from the editor and the staff writer who had been mocking me for my unreliable alphas, which honestly I'd never put a foot wrong in all the time I'd been going off on, on photo shoots for that magazine. And I needed a new car and they basically said, if I bought a BMW, then I could run it in their staff car section. So I could, you know, make it part of my job to have the car. So it seemed like a no brainer. Ow, I just poured coffee over myself, get myself an estate BMW and the one I needed to go for really was the Chris Bangle designed E60 or the E61 variant of a Touring. Now on paper that is the best Touring estate car you can buy. It is beautifully thought out. An enormous boot, incredible economy, nice comfy driver's seat. What's not to love? Well I found out what's not to love. They may well have designed it well but they didn't build it well at all. Now this is going back to 2012. I scoured the internet, Auto Trader, eBay, all those kind of places until I found a car that was exactly what I wanted. An okay-ish mileage, 80,000 miles at three years old. That's not too extreme for like an ex-company car. I figured that's gonna be serviced on the button. It did have full BMW service history, which is what I was looking for. The dealer wasn't very local, so I had to travel to the other side of London to go and collect it. But that's not a problem. I don't mind collecting a car from a way away. That's part of the fun, the expectation of a new car. Guys seemed quite friendly, the car seemed quite nice. I bought the car and drove home. 
all good so far. The only fly in the ointment really was that there was a split in the driver's seat because it's that kind of fake leather stuff and the dealer said they paid to get that sorted. I really can't remember if I ever took him up on that or not. It seemed like a good car though. And the first thing I did was go and buy a set of winter wheels and on the way home, four wheels fitted in the boot, no problem at all. It swallowed them with ease. So I thought, oh, great, I've made the right decision. I was driving around getting 50 miles to the gallon. I was thinking I've made the right choice here. I've done, I've done the right thing. But within a week, the handbrake stopped working. So I spoke to the dealer. They said, yes, okay, you're miles away. Take it to a local independent. We'll sort the, the bill for that one. And it wasn't too bad. It was just because on those E60 BMWs, they've got brake discs at the back and they've got brake drums for the handbrake. Dumb idea because the handbrake drums fur up over time. So you, or ideally what you need to do is just pull the handbrake on very lightly every now and then just to defur the drums. Been sat in dealer stock for a few weeks or months, who knows how long. So that was covered, no problem. Keep on driving, happy as you like. Until a week later, it rained and the central locking stopped working. And again, he authorized get the local independent to fix it, he would foot the bill. So I took it to local independent BMW place. They put the diagnostic in it. Turned out it's something called the aerial diversity fault. Now this has nothing to do with a dance troupe who can't dance together. Nope, it's the central locking receiver. Sits in the boot spoiler of the tailgate. It rained heavily and water got in there. It died. I had a new part from BMW, which should really have been a recall part because it was a known problem. They sent an upgraded part. But that was fitted and the central locking worked again and I even discovered at that point that I had a full closure window so I could open and close the windows from the key fob. Didn't know the car had that until then, so that was a nice surprise. So I carried on driving the car, loading all my mini bags into the boot of it, driving my mini miles to photo shoots and I was happy thinking I'd made the right decision. I was getting good economy and enjoying the car. It's a good driver's car. That is one great thing with the E60 is they do have a great chassis. They're great things to drive. So all good and I was heading down through the newly opened Hindhead Tunnel on the A3 for the first time. Very exciting. Well, I say very exciting. It was for me because halfway through the tunnel, which is a dual carriageway with average speed cameras and no hard shoulder, suddenly there was a judder and I looked in the mirror and a huge cloud of smoke and you cannot stop in that, that tunnel. It curves, so you don't want to be stopping on a curve blind with no hard shoulder. So I had to just kind of slow down and the moment we got out of the tunnel, pull off onto the side of the road and the car was making horrible horrible noises now I wasn't sure what to do at this point so I called the AA had it trailered back to my friendly local independent BMW garage for investigation I dropped an email to the dealer to say this has happened but it was now out of warranty with them and I was pretty sure the turbo had gone and said how much is it going to be to replace the turbo on this car a fair question my task and the answer they replied with was an awful lot of money because you need more than a turbo they suspected at that point i needed a new engine so i had to pay to have the car trailered over to the local main dealer and ask them to put in a goodwill claim to bmw but you shouldn't have an engine failure within weeks of your manufacturer's warranty running out and it did have full bmw history at this point so they got to it they looked at it said someone else has taken the turbo off put it back on the truck and sent it back to the independent I wasn't very happy now because I still had a broken car and now a bill for two transporting costs. So I sent it back to them again and explained the situation more fully and they finally agreed reluctantly to take a look at it. Although there was the caveat, if BMW refused to do a goodwill payment on it, I would be liable for the six or seven hundred pound investigation cost of taking the engine out and stripping it to find out what the problem was. And given the choice of buying a new engine or paying 600 pounds i had to take a chance so roll on a couple of days time i got a phone call that the engine was out and it was absolutely trashed there were bits of turbo had gone through the cylinders they'd gone through their heads the pistons were trashed the cylinder walls were trashed the heads were trashed the valves were trashed i went and had a look and it was it was just messy you could see there was no coming back from that it needed a full new engine as confirmed by bmw now, after a bit of toing and froing between the dealer and BMW head office, BMW very kindly agreed to pay half the cost of a new engine if I covered the other £6,000. I wasn't enamoured with that idea. And my first thought was, in fact, if I put this on YouTube, this is before I had a YouTube channel, if I put this on YouTube and cut it up on my driveway, will I get enough views to cover the cost of the outstanding finance? because at that point I was sick of this car. 
and was fully willing to cut it into little pieces to see if I could make money on the internet. Now after a lot of back and forth, they unexpectedly relented and agreed to give me a new engine. I was just so relieved at this, because it meant I now had a new engine in the car. Everything in front of the gearbox was going to be brand new, starting afresh, just you know, suspension to worry about. And so after a few weeks, I drove off in what was effectively a new 5 Series again. I was very happy. I was happy again and using the car as it was intended. It's got a half ton payload in the back of those E61s with air suspension in the back. So I was using it for trips to the builders merching, buying concrete and bricks and tiles. You could put an entire door, or three doors it turns out, stacked in the boot with a boot shut. This thing is brilliant. Um, that little glass tailgate thing so you can half open the boot, fantastic. We took this thing on family holidays all through Europe. Got photos of it on the ferry in Italy, in the lakes, in Switzerland, in the mountains, across France. We had a great time with that car. Until the next MOT. When I put it in for a service ahead of the MOT and we noticed that the uh, fog lights weren't working. And the fog lights are in the tailgate section of the rear light clusters. So I said to the dealer, can we have a quick look at that? And they said, yes, it's a £99 investigation fee. Okay, well, we can't get through an MOT without it, so we're going to have to. And it turns out another little problem with the E61 is that the tailgate wiring loom frays after a time. And this car is only about four years old at this point. And it cost me, I think we eventually haggled it down to just over a thousand pounds, but including the service, I was out of pocket 1500 quid that week, which included stripping all the trim out the tailgate and the rear of the car, supplying a new driver's side loom, and then because chances are if one side has failed, the other one is going to fail as well, supplying a passenger side loom as well, and fitting all of that to get an MOT. God, I was not happy with the car at that point. So then I kept on driving the car more more miles, more family holidays, and the car had gone from 80,000 to about 140,000 miles. And it was still looking good though, and there weren't really many foibles with it. The filler cap failed on it, there's a little rubber grommet that goes, and it's only about five pounds to replace. I had though been doing double time on the oil service. It's around a 20,000 mile oil service on that car, which is twice what I think the turbo can stand on one of them. So every 10,000 miles, I would DIY oil service it, and at the 20,000 mark, go and get it serviced at a garage and get the book stamped. So, you know, it was gonna keep on lasting nicely. Until one day I had to go to London and I didn't wanna take the train because that is monumentally expensive. So I took a commuter coach, which sounded exciting. No, it doesn't sound exciting at all. It sounds quite dull and it honestly is. However, it is very cheap. And I had to park the car somewhere in a little commuter car park uh, on kind of a, on the M25 periphery, which is fine and people do it every day. Except the day I did it, some people who are less than nice, uh, decided it'd be fun to throw concrete and rocks at the cars parked along the edge of the car park from the field they lived in. Great games. Didn't smash any glass, but it did wreck the roof and both passenger doors and the back wing. So yeah, that was good. Fortunately, I had a friend who was a painter and he only charged me a thousand pounds to repair it. Unfortunately, there was a problem with the paint and it went flat immediately. And then he, went to live in another part of the country and didn't work in car paint anymore. Fortunately, BMW car needed a feature on extreme polishing and we were able to kind of get some kind of a polish through some heavy, heavy detailing. I've got a solid day of polishing on that. <sighs> so it looked kind of presentable, even if it was, to my eyes, not quite right. I kept it a bit longer, up to about 155, 160,000 miles. At which point, it seemed to be okay. I, I think by the time I'd driven that far, we got all the little niggles out of it, as far as I could tell. And I thought, time to get rid of the car. And I was just putting it up for sale, and then my dad needed a car because he was handing back a company car. So we did a deal, he took the car. I thought, everyone's happy, he needs an estate car. I don't need an estate car, well, not that one anyway. Off it went. Unfortunately, within about three months, the back axle was making horrible grumbly noises, so he part exchanged it in a hurry. Now, I'm sure I did have other problems with this because I remember having so much more aggro. This is like a potted history of everything that went wrong. And I was writing a diary on it for BMW Car Magazine, so there's plenty of content. I had other problems with the car, like it would pop a light bulb literally every two weeks. I got through a headlamp bulb about once a month. Changing the angel eyes bulbs on it were an absolute nightmare. One time the washer fluid bottle jammed up, so I had to take the inner wing out of the passenger side to get to that, and that was a pain of a job. Yeah, you know, it seemed to be okay apart from that. But I'm sure I had more issues with this. I, mean, I was looking back through my diary entries and I don't have all the magazines anymore, but I'm sure there were more problems. And this was a car that promised so much and just kept on letting me down in 
big and little ways. And so that was my most disappointing, my worst car. But what is astonishing is that I just checked on the DVLA website, that thing's still around. It's got an MOT until August. And its last MOT had 197,000 miles on it and put 20,000 miles on in the previous year. All it had was a couple of advisories on, on the brake discs being low and a couple of uh, bushes being tired. So, I don't know, maybe we should have stuck onto it and fixed the rear axle. Who knows? If you own MD08 FZV and it is still going strong, let me know. Did I make a mistake in selling it? Did you know it had a new engine at 80,000 miles or 85,000? Because uh, that does mean your engine is half the age of your car still, considering it only has 200,000 miles on it or so. Interesting to hear. So that was my worst car ever. Maybe next week if I don't have parts come through, I'll tell you about every car I've ever owned, which runs to about 30, I think, which isn't as many as a lot of people I know, but it's still enough to keep a 10 minute video going. <laughs> Stay safe everyone, and I'll see you soon, hopefully back out in the garage when some parts arrive. Is that the DHL man? No. See you soon.